Well, thank you, Craig. Really appreciate that kind introduction. Nice to be with you tonight. Can you hear me well like this, or do I need to hold the microphone? We okay? Terrific. Well, if there's a problem, be sure to let me know. But the, uh, the topic that brings us tonight is, I think, an interesting part of ethics, namely the fact that we so often get into those sorts of situations in which there's something going on that we don't much like, something that we find wicked or evil or at least smelly or dangerous or somehow or other we find ourselves dissatisfied and we don't want to cooperate with it. And yet, there are all the complications of life, getting a job done, working one's way through one's normal routine or accomplishing something great, accomplishing something specifically that's very attractive. And so the question in general that I want to pose and reflect on in light of the church's teaching and in light of some good sound philosophical instruction is formally thought of as the cooperation with evil. And the the church's uh, documents, the Vatican documents, the catechism of the church, as well as many a philosopher have reflected on this and have tried to make some distinctions because invariably in moral matters when one gets into considerations about tough topics the way to make progress is usually to try to make some sort of distinction without the distinction everything is all kind of glummed together but that when one makes some distinctions one has some hope of making progress I don't mean to suggest that this is going to make all these issues pollutedly clear and simply easy to decide, for frankly it will not. But it will at least allow some progress, and I think allow some more advanced discussion when one gets to these issues. So what I'd like to try to do on the handout that I provided for you is to talk our way through some of these issues. I'll begin with some references to the catechism. By the catechism, of course, I mean the relatively new, say 10 years old, Catechism of the Catholic Church, and you've got some numbers there. And then the book at the bottom, and the book it's referred to on the second page, is a very classic text in the um, Catholic tradition. It's by a man named Fagathy, Austin Fagathy, and the book is called Right and Reason. As you can see, it's into its ninth edition already in the 80s. There have been some editions subsequent to that. But it's, it's one that's particularly clear on some of these issues. So what I'd like to try to do for, say, until now, until about maybe quarter to eight or so, about 40 minutes, is to just talk our way through this issue, and I'll use various examples in the course of doing so. But I very much invite you for the question period that will follow that. Perhaps you have some of the more specific items. Invariably, there are just a whole raft of issues on which this might well be exemplified, and perhaps we can work our way through some of those examples at that time. And I I look forward to just having a good conversation with you on this because they're invariably in ethics. And and I think Catholic ethics, Catholic moral teaching has always been very good on this, important as it is to have some good, clear principles and important as it is to have some nice, sharp distinctions. Where the rubber meets the road is in the concrete case. And so it really is very much apropos to try to think of some of the concrete issues and the various situations in which we get ourselves, and hopefully we can apply some of these principles. So that's the general idea. I begin then at the Catechism 1731 to 1738. Some of this will, I hope, strike you as very commonsensical, for the Church's position in matters of morality is intended to reflect a lot of common sense. That is, things that we picked up from the Bible and that have come to be a part of our faith precisely because they have been revealed, but also things that are common sense for anybody who's right-minded, who's reasonable. Granting those can sometimes be hard to find in the workplace or in the public domain, but much of this will have, I think, the, the, the general impression of being commonsensible, and the reason why it might strike us as commonsensible is in a way because the church has been teaching it for so long. 
We begin at 1736 there. Every act directly willed is imputable to its author, but an action can be indirectly voluntary when it results from negligence regarding something that one should have known or done. For example, an accident arising from ignorance of traffic laws. Now here we're at the very, very general level of explanation. And simply what the church is asserting is we are responsible for whatever we do, for whatever we choose to do, or for whatever we choose to omit. And the claim is that we're only responsible for that in which we make a choice. If we had no choice in the matter whatsoever, we're exonerated. We had no responsibility that we bear because we didn't in any way choose. But what this first part from the catechism is intending to bring out is that we have to handle the word choice in a relatively accurate and strict way. Namely, we can choose to act, but we can also choose not to act. And so any time we are actually choosing, we bear some responsibility. Whether the choice be for a positive action, if I use my hands, use my feet, use my tongue, go somewhere, do something, or it could very well be the matter of choosing not to do something. Again, in the simplest way, if I see someone in need and decide, no, I'm going to hurry on my way, I bet you we all remember from the parable of the Good Samaritan how the, the minister and the priest, those, the Jewish rabbi and the Jewish Levi, were judged, right? They chose not to do anything, but in passing by, the man who was there very much in need of aid, there was some fault to be found. And our Lord praises the Good Samaritan, that is, that fellow from Samaria, who although he did not in any way know and was not in any way related to the person, nonetheless saw that this was a human being in need and chose to honor that need. So this first point is simply does the suggestion that direct willing, that is when we're conscious, that is when we're alert to what the situation requires, and when we make some choice, either a choice to act or a result, a choice not to act, we bear some responsibility. Granting that in the case of not acting, we're a little bit more indirect, and that's what I think that second sentence is trying to bring out. If our negligence is the result of something happening that we should have stepped in on to prevent or to redress or to remedy, we bear some responsibility. We may not perhaps bear the same degree of responsibility, but we bear some responsibility nevertheless because we deliberately and directly chose something. At 1737, an effect can be tolerated without being willed by its agent. For instance, a mother's exhaustion from tending her sick child, a bad effect is not imputable if it was not willed either as an end or as a means of an action. For instance, a death a person incurs in aiding someone in danger. For a bad effect to be imputable, it must be foreseeable, and the agent must have the possibility of avoiding it, as in the case of manslaughter caused by a drunken driver. Now, in that paragraph, what I take the catechism to be explaining is, is that we do have to make a distinction between what we cause to happen and what we merely allow to happen. Uh, again, without getting into all the hard cases here, I was talking with some of you before the lecture this after, before the lecture tonight, and I gather that some of you were over at Fordham's Lincoln Center campus and were hearing a lecture having to do with the Terry Schiavo case. I grant very complicated case, complicated set of circumstances. Don't mean to try to suggest that one can solve all of that in one fell swoop. But it's one of those type of cases on which I think we're all somewhat familiar and where I would suggest something like this is, is very much at issue. Namely, to tolerate something is to say, I allow it to happen. And when the church has reflections on end-of-life issues, granting we're not dealing particularly here with end-of-life issues, we're dealing with that cooperation with evil, which I'll get to in just a minute. But when you're dealing with something like an end-of-life issues, the church does have a tremendous focus and insistence that one should try to support and defend and take care of human life all the way from the womb, from conception until the time of natural death. But the church does not insist that one must keep somebody alive at all costs. Right? There is a time for allowing someone to die, allowing this to take place. 